Good evening. Welcome to Westminster on what's been another dramatic day. Gordon Brown has announced he's going to stand down as Prime Minister, making way for a new Labour Party leader by the autumn. The attempt to form a new and stable government for Britain after last Thursday's general election has lasted another day, and this evening is no nearer conclusion. The Liberal Democrats, with enough MPs to join the Conservatives to provide stable government, haven't reached agreement with them on key issues of policy. The Tories have upped the ante tonight by offering a referendum on changing the voting system. But the Liberal Democrats earlier said they will start detailed negotiations with Labour. So, the Liberal Democrats tonight seem to have two suitors. And the question is, which will they marry? Or will they refuse to be led to the altar? We're going to be looking at this tonight, and crucial to it is our system of electing MPs. It entitles the person who can command a majority of the House of Commons to assume the Premiership. And the figures are very important. The Tories, remember, won 306 seats last Thursday. That'll probably be 307 if they win Thursk and Moulton. That's not enough, of course, to give them a majority in the House of Commons. They'd face a potential opposition if everybody opposed them, made up of Labour's 258, the Liberal Democrats 57, and 28 others, including the Nationalists, a total of 343. But if the Tories and Lib Dems can agree to work together, they would have 364, the stable majority everybody's talking about. Now, if Labour tries to form a government alongside the Liberal Democrats, they get 315, not a majority, and things then start to get more complicated. They could assume they get the backing of Northern Ireland's SDLP and the Alliance MP. They can also probably assume Sinn Féin won't take up their seats in the Commons. And they'll try to sign up the new Green MP and the Independent Unionist MP in this so-called Rainbow Coalition. But then they'd still have to rely on the Democratic Unionists from Northern Ireland or the Scottish and Welsh Nationalists not voting against them. So it is very complicated. Just what has been going on since election night? Let's just have a look at that and then we'll talk about what's been happening today. Emily Maitlis has been having a look at how events have unfolded on an extraordinary few days since the general election in Westminster. For four days the country's waited with bated breath to find out who will become the next Prime Minister. For four days, negotiations have rumbled on between Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats. A deal, it seemed, was in the air. Then, at five o'clock this afternoon, this. Mr Clegg has just informed me that while he intends to continue his dialogue that he has begun with the Conservatives, he now wishes also to take forward formal discussions with the Labour Party. Suddenly, for all parties, everything was up for grabs. The Lib Dem leader had long made it clear he didn't want to work with Gordon Brown, something the Prime Minister now seemed to accept, announcing he'd be gone by September. The reason that we have a hung parliament is that no single party and no single leader was able to win the full support of the country. As a leader of my party, I must accept that that is a judgment on me. I therefore intend to ask the Labour parties to set and train the processes needed for its own leadership election. I would hope that it would be completed in time for the new leader to be in post by the time of the Labour Party conference. It's been the most extraordinary election many can ever remember. The first hints that it would be a long game came with the exit poll on Thursday night. Ten o'clock. And this is what we're saying. It's going to be a hung parliament with the Conservatives as the largest party. But this was just an exit poll, and the three party leaders were anxious to know if the prediction would come true as results poured in. By early morning it was clear it would. Expectation of an outright winner dissolved now a deal would have to be forged. It seems this morning that it's the Conservative Party that has more votes and more seats, though not an absolute majority. And that is why I think it is now for the Conservative Party to prove that it is capable of seeking to govern in the national interest. Confirmation then from Mr Clegg he would help the party that had won more of the public's support. Gordon Brown's response, so different four days ago, was to be a mere bystander. Mr Cameron and Mr Clegg should clearly be entitled to take as much time as they feel necessary. For my part, I should make clear that I would be willing to see any of the party leaders. 
And then, from the man who talked of big society, came the big gesture. I want to make a big, open and comprehensive offer to the Liberal Democrats. I want us to work together in tackling our country's big and urgent problems, the debt crisis, our deep social problems and our broken political system. How big and how open became the key question. How close could any of the leaders get without alienating their own parties? With everything still to play for, there are four real options. A formal coalition between the Conservatives and the Lib Dems. This means joint policies will be agreed in advance and Liberal Democrats would sit in the Cabinet. Or Labour and the Lib Dems could join forces in what Gordon Brown calls a progressive coalition. We don't know who the PM would be and to make up the numbers, they'd still need other parties. Alternatively, the Conservatives, as the largest party, could form a minority government with some backing from Nick Clegg. It's what they call a confidence and supply deal, and here's how it would work. The Lib Dems would promise to support the government on big votes, votes of confidence, like the Queen's speech and the budget. In return, the Lib Dems would get some influence and promises on policy. If the Lib Dems choose to support no one, David Cameron could go it alone. For each policy, they'd have to scrabble support. Every single Commons vote would be a battle. Tonight, it's not clear which of those options is most likely. The Cabinet has already filed into number 10 to face the man who won't be their leader for much longer, whilst Nick Clegg confirmed he was indeed still open to offers from everyone. Given the urgency of the need to have a resolution to this whole situation, we think it's the right thing, the responsible thing, to now open talks on exactly the same basis as we've been having with the Conservative Party, with the Labour Party, whilst of course continuing our discussions with uh, the Conservatives. If it was a gamble, it worked. Within the last hour, senior Tory negotiator William Hague okay. upped the offer. In the interests of trying to create a stable, secure government, we will go the extra mile and we will offer to the Liberal Democrats in a coalition government the holding of a referendum on the alternative vote system. Nick Clegg, you will recall, once insisted he would not be kingmaker. Right now, you could be forgiven for thinking he's become just that. Well, I'm joined now by the BBC's political editor, Nick Robinson. This is becoming a sort of auction, isn't it? It is. It's been an extraordinary day. I've seen extraordinary days before, but none quite like this. Remember, just a matter of a few hours ago, Tory and Liberal Democrat negotiators were emerging from a meeting saying they'd had good discussions and the Liberal Democrats were announcing they had minor concerns, they needed some clarification on voting reform. We now are in an utterly different situation where there is now an offer from Labour, a full coalition, automatic change in the voting system to what's called the alternative vote and a referendum on a more radical change in the voting system with Gordon Brown standing down after six months and a new Prime Minister or from the Conservatives also a coalition, in full, in other words, with Liberal Democrats around a cabinet table with David Cameron as Prime Minister, with a referendum on whether to change to the so alternative vote. So are you saying vote. it's a coalition on ba either a coalition with Labour yeah. or a coalition with the Tories, and those are the only two choices they the are, have, as or we do speak, nothing? As tonight, those are pretty much the only choices. Mm -hmm. The only alternative would be if the Liberal Democrats chose not to go into either government, and therefore left the Tories in a minority government situation, desperately trying to find a few votes here and a few votes there, vote by vote to stay yeah, in power, how, which would be a recipe for how chaos. How would that work? I mean, if the Liberal Democrats don't make up their mind, and they, they might be in danger of making fools of themselves if they don't, having got to this position. Well, I think that's right. The extraordinary thing about this is the Liberal Democrats have got their dream. They said a hung parliament's what they wanted. They said partnership politics is what they wanted. But having got it, they're in the unusual position of being able to choose to go one way or the other. That's the cards that the electorate have dealt. And they are finding it mighty difficult to make that choice. And if they can't make up their minds or, their, or the, the party divides over which way they should go, what then? I mean, the, can David Cameron become Prime Minister in a minority government? How does that happen? He could, Without any of these people supporting He could him? technically, because he would be the uh, leader of the largest party, do that. But he would depend for his majority, as you saw in your opening graphic, in order to get his way, people either have to agree to abstain and say, look, we won't bring you down, or they have to actively 
support him. But crucially, I think we're talking tonight about a decision for Nick Clegg and the Liberal Democrats. All the signs just a few hours ago was that he was closing in on a deal not to be in a coalition, but an arrangement with the Conservatives, with detailed negotiations okay, in policy. And you have no idea which way it's going to go well, at the moment. We know this one thing, David, which is while he was talking to the Conservatives, his negotiators had had a secret meeting with members of the Labour Party. They had not told the Tories or the media about it, or their own party. We also know that he knew what Gordon Brown was about to say. He'd been consulted about it. He'd been informed about it. He emerged and praised it. So all the signs are he's switching horses. But whether he will or not, we don't know. All right. This evening, Conservative MPs, remember they haven't been involved yet, have been meeting in the House of Commons to discuss their options following today's events. And Carol Walker is down there for us. Carol, what's actually gone on this evening? Well, there was this meeting of the entire Conservative Parliamentary Party addressed by David Cameron. I can tell you, David, that as he went into that meeting, David Cameron got a huge round of applause, cheers, banging of desks and so on. But that actually he then went into that meeting and took the party through the very difficult situation in which the Conservatives find themselves. And what David Cameron said is that he believed that it was right now for the party to offer the Lib Dems this idea of a referendum on a change to the AV system. This is a man, a party leader, who throughout the election campaign said that he didn't want to change the voting system, said that he felt it would lead to more uncertainty, indecisive government and so on. But he spelt out, as he saw it, the options for his party and said that he felt that that was the best and the only way that you could ever end up with a stable government for the country. Furthermore, what the Conservatives are offering now is coalition, not just some sort of arrangement whereby the Lib Dems would support the Conservatives to get through certain key bits of legislation, but a formal coalition. And I understand yeah, that one of the... How did go down with the Tories, Carol? Well, amazingly, and I've talked to a lot of Conservative MPs on all wings of the party, they appear to have swallowed it. They appear to have accepted that this is the situation that they are in, that it would be very difficult indeed to go it alone as a minority government. And I think crucially, David Cameron has made it clear to them that in this referendum, they would be free, Tory MPs would be free to campaign against a change to the voting system. OK, Carol, thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm joined here now by the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Alistair Darling, the Shadow Education Secretary, Michael Gove, and the former leader of the Liberals, Lord Steele, and they don't want to negotiate here, but I want to ask them some questions. Uh, Alistair Darling, first of all, uh, you're just hanging on to power by your fingernails. You were trounced in the election. How can you look the electorate in the face and say, we're now trying to stitch up a deal that will keep Labour in office? Well, we're not. Uh, Gordon Brown said on Friday, when it was clear that we had a hung parliament, it was clear that no party had an overall majority, as you've been setting out graphically there, that it was right the Liberals should go and talk to David Cameron and the Conservatives to see if they could reach some sort of accommodation or deal. He said that was the right thing to do because the Conservatives are the largest party, but he said if the Liberals wanted to come back and talk to us, then of course we'd listen. Now, today, they have come back and said they want to talk to us. Yes, we'll do that. Maybe the discussions will lead somewhere where maybe they won't. But I you don't want, know. You want to answer my question. I said, how can you look the electorate in the face, having been trounced? It wasn't Gordon Brown who was defeated. It was Labour yes. who was defeated this election. And now you're saying we're trying to stitch up a deal no, to not, keep us in office, we're not, keep you as Chancellor. What, what, what we need to do is to make sure that there is a government in place that can take the country forward. Now, nobody's got an overall uh, majority at the moment. We s it was right the Conservatives and the Liberals should talk to each other. The Conservatives are the biggest party. Now, I don't, I'm not privy to those discussions. I don't know how they've gone. Like you, uh, they appear to be going quite well. Then the Liberals said they wanted to talk to us. Yes, we will talk to them, but the important thing is I have no idea whether or not this approach will result in anything or nothing. So I just you, don't so, know. So would you welcome a Conservative Liberal Democrat coalition that gave stable government? Well, I, I, you know, I, I'm never going to welcome a Conservative government full stop. I mean, you know, I, I, I think they're, they're just plain wrong. But on, you want so stability. Much. Of, course, of course I want a strong government. Uh, but if it turns out that the Liberals and the Conservatives can't reach a deal or, or whatever and they, and, and, and they don't get stability, then so that's something we would want to avoid. I'm just simply stating the factual position Gordon Brown is still the Prime Minister. It's, he remains a Prime Minister until such time as another government is formed. We've got that continuity. 
I think for all our sakes, frankly, and just listening to that report just now, the sooner these matters are brought to a conclusion, the better. All that has happened today it, in relation to this matter is the Liberals have said they want to talk to us. As I say, I have no idea whether or not that will result in anything developing or not. Michael Gove, do you think uh, Gordon Brown is right to make this pitch for a coalition with the Liberal Democrats? I can understand why the Labour Party have made this pitch, but I think that the Liberal Democrats in the country have a clear choice. Um, if we have um, a stable Liberal Democrat Conservative coalition, we can be certain that over the next four years we can govern in the national interest. We can also be certain that someone who was actually presented to the British people as a potential Prime Minister is that Prime Minister. And we can also be certain that the British people will have a chance to decide whether or not we have voting reform or not. If the Liberal Democrats choose, and of course it's their decision, if they choose to join with the Labour Party, then we will probably end up with someone as Prime Minister who didn't go through the process in the general election of scrutiny by the electorate, will have the second unelected Labour Prime Minister in succession. It will also be the case that the government will be more fragile at a time when we need strength and stability. And it will also be the case, on the basis of the prospectus that Alistair and his team have laid out, that we will have a change in the voting system without the British people having had a chance to vote on it in a referendum. What if the Liberal Democrats can't decide to join either you or Labour? Well, Obviously, I believe in the national interest it would be better if we had a stable government. I believe that Conservatives and Liberal Democrats together can provide that. But if no, but the Liberal Democrats choose not to support either us or the Labour Party, on that basis, a minority government would be the option. But uh, as your report, I think, made clear earlier, um, a minority government would be subject to having to live day by day, vote by vote. And but I think given the nature of the problems... How would you ever get You go to the House of Commons, uh, and, and, and what would you do? Try and get everybody to vote Gordon Brown out? as Prime Minister? And, well, uh, well, I mean, you couldn't we're, put we're, it together. We're in uncharted waters, and there are, uh, there's a new political situation emerging. But we do know, and I think Alistair, to be fair to him, pointed out the correct constitutional position. Gordon Brown is still the Prime Minister until Parliament meets and until there is a vote. I hope that by the time Parliament meets, in fact, I hope considerably before that, we will have a strong and stable government. And it seems right. to me that the arithmetic um, and the way in which we best respect the voters' verdict because there was a clear rejection of the Labour Party, is to have a government which combines Conservatives David and Liberal Steele, Democrats. David uh, um, Steele, Nick Clegg made a great point of saying the Liberal Democrats would not be the kingmakers. He is now, in effect, the kingmaker, except he can't make out which suitor to go with, isn't he? No, oh, the same team are going to be talking to both parties, and that seems to me to be perfectly rational, perfectly sensible. Uh, if I may pick up Michael's point about the unelected Prime Minister, may I remind you John Major and Alec Douglas Hume were both uh, unelected Prime Ministers, so there's no party political issue about that. The fact that Gordon Brown has made, I think, a very statesmanlike statement tonight, saying that he was obviously uh, uh, rejected by the electorate, he's going to go in September, that opens the way, I think, to possibility, and Alistair's right, it's only a possibility of talking to the Labour Party about forming a stable government. If we have a minority Conservative government, I think I can assure you, although I don't speak for the, the, the party anymore, I'm retired, but I'm pretty certain they would act responsibly uh, in, in allowing that government and, to and get through. How do, you negotiate, how do you negotiate with Gordon Brown, a man that Nick Clegg uh, said his day was over, he was squatting well, in number 10, and you don't know who's, going, you don't know who's going to be the new leader of the party? How they, can you negotiate? I'm pretty certain they won't be negotiating with Gordon Brown. There will presumably be right. a Labour team uh, doing the negotiation. I don't know who they are. Um, but but uh, it'll be the. I mean, David Cameron wasn't doing the negotiating on behalf of the. Tory. All right. Well, I'm joined now by John Reid, former Home Secretary, um, uh, who was uh, not in the House of Commons anymore. Uh, Mr. Reid, what do you think of this? Do you think that there's a danger of the coalition of the losers if Labour and the Liberal Democrats get together? Well, I think the Prime Minister was was wise and dignified today in saying that uh, uh, he would step down. I think that was right. Um, on the other hand, I'm afraid I think it is uh, uh, a very bad mistake to contemplate uh, uh, and to propose and, I suppose, entice uh, a Lib Lab coalition. I think it's bad for the country. I think it will prove pretty disastrous for both parties in it. And, and in fact, I think it's bad for Gordon as well. Why do you say that? Well, I think it's bad for the country because, first of all, it's inherently unstable because Labour and the Liberals together still don't have a majority. So we'll be dependent upon uh, trying to bring in the votes of assorted uh, Scott nationalists and uh, the parties in Northern Ireland, whose main concern, of course, will be that they should not suffer the cutbacks in public expenditure that the English would. 
and I can't think of anything that is likely to further enrage uh, an electorate which will already um, perceive, I think, that people are, are cocking a snoop at their um, electoral uh, results by the two minor parties, as they now are, trying to form a government. Remember, John Reid, John Reid, just let me put, stay with us, but let me put that point to David Steele. Do, do you think John Reid's right in this? You're, you're no, just, I, I think, it's going I to be think, a disaster if you I do think, it together. I think John is wrong on two grounds. First of all, you have to remember that more people voted Labour and Liberal Democrat than voted Conservative, many more. So the, the, there was, if you like, a progressive majority, which is disorganised, they're in two separate parties. But the potential is there to have a government which reflects the majority opinion in the country. Well, in that and case, in that case, we, there should be no discussion about proportional representation. The only party, the only party who made that an issue were the Liberals, and they got 24% of the vote, and 76% of the voters voted against that. So to cobble it together on the basis of the two parties who lost, in our case, the biggest loss, the biggest electoral defeat in our history in terms of seats, nearly 100 seats, bigger than anything except 1931, and the Liberals who lost seats to cobble together some form of coalition in the face of the obvious animosity that was shown towards us by the electorate and then make the fulcrum of that platform the, the main stepping stone of it, an issue that was never put to the people, the proportional representation and, and uh, claim that we're going to try and change it, it, a centuries old it would be put uh, in method a of election. It seems to, me, seems to me completely removed from you, any fairness you seem to be saying You seem to be saying Gordon Brown should simply have stood down when the election results came in on Friday. Uh, do, do you think a large number of Labour MPs feel as you do? Well, I don't know. I know other people who are ultra-loyalists, like David um, Blunkett, who I spoke to earlier tonight, and he authorised me to use his name, and I'm sure many others. Look, all I'm saying is this. The Labour Party has had a bit of a drumming. I don't like that. I don't like to see the Conservatives win. But they came out in a far better fashion than we did. Under those circumstances, behave in a democratic and dignified fashion. And that is the start of revitalising the Labour Party. There will be other elections. Uh, and if we watch the minutes only, then we will lose the hours. And I believe that that is not a good thing for the Labour Party, but more importantly, perhaps than anything else, it's not a good thing for the country. And we should do what is truly in the national interest, and that is let the major party try to form its administration. If that fails, then fair enough, we can see what might be done under the circumstances. But I think if we don't do that, if we don't do the decent thing, and incidentally, how we are supposed to have a negotiation which will bind a future Labour leader is beyond me. No government can bind its successor, no Prime Minister, right, if, if me, for instance, if, we were to... Let me put this to David Steele and then come to you, Michael Gove. If the Labour Party says that to the negotiating team from the Liberal Democrats, that's fine, John. They, 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 the negotiations will go nowhere, and therefore the only talks will be with the Conservatives. But the point he makes is that, uh, the point that you won't accept, that Labour was defeated, and, and, and under, were, in, in, in a sense of decency, you retire we are hurt all, we and, are, and regroup. You don't are, try and stay in power. We're all minorities now. The Conservative Party went into the election hoping to win. They didn't win. Nobody won. And we, we're dealing with the consequences. All right. And I, I still say that a minority Conservative government is possible, an arrangement with the Lib Dems is possible, an arrangement with the Labour Party. Well, what, what, what uh, John Reid says must be music to your ears, uh, Michael Gove, because he says that the whole thing will be a disaster if they get together with the Liberal Democrats. But from your point of view, does a moment come when you have to say, look, enough is enough. We've talked for four days. This must come to an end. Well, the because at the moment, you see, if I might say so, at the moment, you seem to be, you know. <laughs> You, you, you but the Prime Minister comes out and says he's going to resign, and the next thing is you suddenly offer something that you haven't offered before, which is a different voting system with a referendum. So you're being sort of teased along, aren't you? Our decision to make this offer um, was being discussed by the Shadow Cabinet before Gordon Brown announced his resignation. And our view was that in the national interest, it would be a good thing to form a stable government on appropriate foundations. In order to but do you that... You clearly didn't make this offer until Gordon Brown had gone outside number 10 and said, I'm going to stand down and we want to talk to the Liberal Dem... Liberal it was Democrats. David Cameron's intention to make that offer, but because ours is a democratic party, it was discussed both with the Shadow Cabinet and with the Parliamentary Party, and they gave David the endorsement to make this offer. More than that, I think that... Um, by making this offer, we've shown that we, I hope, appreciate that there's a new dynamic here. 
we don't have a majority, if we are going to have a coalition with the Liberal Democrats, then it should be on a basis of shared trust. And that means give and take. However, there are certain steps beyond which we won't go. And we believe that while it's perfectly legitimate to have a referendum on voting reform, you cannot, as the Labour Party currently proposed to do, ram through a change to the voting system in the House All of right. Commons without consulting the people. Do you think it's going to work? Do you think you're going to get your deal with the Liberal Democrats? It's a matter for the Liberal Democrats. Um, and no, but I mean, do you think it's going to work? Well, I don't know. I mean, there's a clear choice. I think that the um, offer that David Cameron is making is in the best interests of the country and stable government. I think over the next four years, there are going to have to be some very tough decisions. And if they're going to be taken by government, it is better if it's taken by a government where there is trust and a clear parliamentary majority rather than the, um, to my mind, more unstable coalition right. that John Reid so accurately and, and described. How, and how long? Another day? Another two days? Uh, another week? Doesn't matter? It's important very briefly. that we conclude things as quickly as possible. But the ball rests in the court of the Liberal Democrats. Right. I know they're taking it seriously. Well, thank all three of you very much indeed. And now let's get the latest from the Liberal Democrats. Mike Sargent is at Cowley Street. Mike. Yes, we've seen uh, pizzas being delivered in the last half an hour. It could be a very long night here at Liberal Democrat headquarters. David Cameron has spoken to Nick Clegg on the phone. He's given him some further details of that offer of a referendum on the voting system. Also some clarification on one or two other issues surrounding tax reform and education. We understand that Liberal Democrat MPs are going to meet again at 10 p.m. tonight. And it feels like that meeting is make your mind up time in terms of the Tory offer at least. But of course they might not be able to decide. And if they can't decide then the talks with Labour come back into sharp focus. So the question for Nick Clegg tonight is can he conduct these talks on two fronts or will divisions within his party start to emerge? It's a big test of his political skill. Thank you very much. Well, Ian Watson is in Downing Street for the latest from the Labour Party. Ian. Yes, it's been an astonishing day, hasn't it? First thing this morning, a senior Liberal Democrat said that if Gordon Brown, Brown stood down, then serious negotiations with Labour could begin. By five o'clock, Gordon Brown was gone, and now Peter Mandelson is leading those negotiations with the Liberal Democrats to try and find an alternative to a deal with the Conservatives. But of course, we're also being launched into a Labour leadership contest. Gordon Brown was very concerned that the Foreign Secretary, David Miliband, would come out behind me from Downing Street and announce his intention to stand tonight, diverting attention away from these talks with Liberal Democrats. But he got agreement at the Cabinet that no candidate would come out and make an, an initial announcement that they were standing as Labour leader tonight. We know that the Deputy Leader, Harriet Harman, has wrote herself out for the time being. But it's very possible, and I would say, suggest very likely, that uh, Ed Balls, the Children's Secretary, will oppose David Miliband when the time comes. So uh, is there concern that uh, the Liberal Democrats won't know who they're dealing with, as we were discussing here? There is some concern about that. Clearly, a negotiating team has been put in place by Lord Mandelson, but unless it includes all the likely leadership contenders, and certainly the two most likely are David Miliband and Ed Balls, Liberal Democrats might be worried about what a future Labour leader would deliver and whether they can trust them to deliver. But at the moment, on the table, is a referendum of proportional representation, no matter who the leader is. Thanks very much. Let's just briefly go to Canada Gate outside Buckingham Palace. Nick Witchell is there. Um, oh, we can't go there, apparently. We will go there, of course, if there is a new Prime Minister. If Gordon Brown, however, remains in office because of a deal between Labour and the Liberal Democrats, there'll be no going to the palace. If there is a going to the palace, we'll be there. The political world in turmoil tonight as the parties try to maximise the advantage of the poor hands the election dealt them. At this stage, no one knows what the outcome will be, I suspect. Not even Nick Clegg, not Gordon Brown, not David Cameron. There could still be a long way to go. Good night.